Hey guys, TV people are here. How you doing? Hey, I bet you think the seas for just swimming and boating. Well, it's not. No, it's a lot more than that. We're gonna discover some neat things about the sea. Yeah, we all have a special story to tell. Let's get started. Roll the titles. No, no, no. We need something cooler than that. Wisdom. Cool. Take it, Matt. Hey, I'm Matt Simpson, and this is Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution. They do all kinds of cool oceanographic research here, like aquaculture, bioluminescence, and we'll find out how sea life can lead to new discoveries in medicine. Let's rock and roll. You may be wondering why we're in a freezer. Well, in these crates are frozen specimens from under the sea. They're used for research here at Harbor Branch. It's freezing. I gotta get out of here. This is one of the labs at the Harbor Branch Biomedical Marine Research Laboratory. Uh, this is Dr. Ross Longley. Dr. Longley, could you tell us how all this stuff relates to what we saw in the freezer? Sure, Matt. Each one of these vials that you see here is the result of each of those organisms ground up and put into what we call solvent. We're testing each of these to see if they might have some type of anti-cancer activity. Who knows? There may be the next anti-cancer drug in this set of vials. Cool. We start out going to sea, and we collect all these different plants and animals, bring them up, grind them up, and make these extracts. We have essentially a, a treasure chest of, of organisms, even here, frozen away ready to be analyzed in a number of different uh, disease states such as cancer. We have no idea what, what we're going to find out there at sea. Hi, I'm Thomas Anderson and I'm from Braddock Senior High and we're going on a real cool adventure. Born in Key Largo. We were a group of seven eager for adventure. We headed into the mangrove maze of Everglades National Park in Upper Florida Bay. As we got on our way, all I could think of was say goodbye to all of this and hello to oblivion. Search on, man. Our job was to ban baby bald eagles and ospreys and take blood samples from them. The problem was to find them without getting lost ourselves. The birds live on little islands in the bay that are part island and part swamp. No one is allowed to go on the island, so we needed special permits. Because most of the food supply of the eagles and ospreys comes from Florida Bay, their health and condition will help us understand the condition of the bay. In other words, they are what they eat. The eeriness of the bay was only made worse by the cold and the rain of this March day. The water turned chalky white and the sky was blanketed with clouds that hid the sun from view and made knowing our direction almost impossible. Finally, we spotted a nest. Brian Milley, our biologist from the Miami Museum of Science, went to check it out. No good, no one was home. So we were off again on our quest. Search on, man. Wisdom. Did we hook up with the Eagles? Find out when we come back. Hi, I'm Paul Constant. I'm a student at Atlantic High School in Delray Beach. I've been studying codeum algae blooms for the past two years. This is my friend, Brian LaPointe. He's a research biologist that specializes in algae. We're going to go take a look at the codeum blooms off Palm Beach. While we're going out to the bloom, Brian's going to show you the situation at Florida Bay. To really understand South Florida's coastal pollution problem, it really helps to stand back and take a look at the big picture. Let's go up and see.
Now that we're up in the air, we can take a look at the big picture and some of uh, man's sources of nutrients that are affecting the coastal zone. What we see here is agricultural activities in South Bay County that border Everglades National Park. One of the primary fertilizers used in South Florida is phosphorus. It's used because it makes the plants grow. However, when it rains, much of this phosphorus runs off into the coastal zone where it ends up in places like Florida Bay. And there, it also makes plants grow, but in this case, it makes algae bloom. What we see below us is Taylor Slough, which was one of the major pathways by which fresh water naturally flowed through the Everglades and into Florida Bay. Today, however, much of this fresh water does not flow through the slough and has been diverted through water management canal systems uh, and pumping structures into the coastal zone where they carry man's pollution. saw the large algae blooms in Florida Bay. Here we are at the Lake Worth Inlet. It's kind of windy and rainy out, but despite that, we're going to look for another type of algae bloom that's occurring on the reefs in this area. Are these algae blooms caused by the same reasons? Yes, they are, Paul. Uh, nutrient runoff from land. As you see right over here, you can see the darker water that represents fresh water coming off land, carrying the nutrients right out the inlets over the coral reefs where they stimulate the algae blooms. Is this the same type of algae seen in the Florida Bay? Uh, no, it isn't, Paul. This is a different alga. It's a large macroscopic green alga that we call codium, and it forms blankets over the reef surface up to several meters thick, and it suffocates, kills coral sponges, and reduces the habitat on these reefs. Why don't we go take a look at it? All right. That was bad. Why don't we get back into the boat? Let's go find some algae. All right. The algae bloom we saw in Florida Bay, that's killing seagrasses mainly by blocking light that the seagrasses need to grow. And they've lost about 70,000 acres of seagrasses in Florida Bay. Codium algae here in, in Palm Beach is very similar to that in some ways, but also different in others. Right blankets the reefs in massive quantities and blocks out the sunlight and doesn't allow proper water circulation that the reefs need to live. Besides all the other things, Brian, it's, this algae kind of looks like green slime on our reefs. Reminds me of spinach fettuccine all over this reef. Let's go topside. Hey, Brian, getting up wasn't so bad. Well, now that you've seen the codium bloom here and the algae bloom in Florida Bay, let me show you a solution. This is our project on Pigeon Key. It's an innovative wastewater treatment system in which we're taking domestic wastewaters that are nutrient rich and using dense cultures of algae and fish to purify these wastewaters, remove the nutrients, and provide commercially valuable products in the process. So this is a very beneficial system? Very much so and very timely also, Paul. 
thanks for today, Brian. I had a great time. You're welcome, Paul. Glad you got to see that algae bloom. Unfortunately, these algae blooms are going to get a lot worse before they get better. You know, Brian, you're right. But uh, thanks for today. Okay, Paul. You take care. All right. See you later. He's not that bad for an older guy. We're in Little Madeira Bay and Crocodile Drag over on the way to Flamingo. We're about a third of the way there from Key Largo. That's our Captain Sterling. I'm kind of glad he seems to know where we are. To me, it seemed like we were running around in circles. Finally, we found an island that Brian felt had some problems with bald eagles. There was only one way to find out. Get out and slog through the mud. There was a nest, but was it another false lead? Not this time. This one had baby eagles in it. We got our gear out and started to create a makeshift laboratory on the island. But first, I had to see them for myself. Unbelievable. Really, really cool. Hang in there. We'll be right back. Aquaculture is basically farming the seas, and if you got a few minutes, I'll show you what it's all about. Come on. Yeah. Well, Matt, first in here, what we've got to do is actually grow the food or the algae, which is needed as the feed to grow a clam or an oyster or a fish or a shrimp or a lobster. So first thing we do is we grow green types of plants in tanks, just as like you would grow grass in your front yard or tomatoes. We use a specific type of fertilizer, and we grow thousands of little tiny microscopic algae, or sometimes called phytoplankton. And that's our food. Come on down here and I'll show you what we feed them to. Right here in this tank, we're drip feeding some of this algae constantly to little tiny clams that are about, oh, maybe three weeks old. What looks just like little tiny powder or little pebbles or grains of sand are actually each a tiny baby clam. Brad. To give you a success story of what we can really do here in aquaculture, the state of Florida prior to 1985, for 100 years, only produced about one million clams per year. Over the past five years, we've produced over 100 million clams from this facility alone. A person can grow now with this technology one million clams in one year on one acre. Cool. Let's go see something else like NASA grouper. How about those, Matt? These are NASA grouper. Grouper is one of the mainstays of the fishermen in the Caribbean islands and in South Florida. However, lately, NASA grouper has been very hard to get. We've done the first Nassau grouper spawn successfully here three years ago, and what you see here now are the offspring of that single spawn. Surprisingly, the place we collected them from are now almost extinct of Nassau grouper, and we've returned half of these fish back to the island to hopefully repopulate it. What's the maximum that these kinds of groupers can grow up to? Well, they can get very large. The whole grouper family has some of the biggest fish we know of. However, these are about 15 pounds, and these are about three pounds. If we were going to farm groupers, we would probably only grow them to one pound, two pounds. That's a perfect size for a fillet for a 
plate for a nice dinner for one person. Let me show you something else that hopefully will taste pretty good on your plate, and those are spiny lobsters. Yeah, they are. These are something that's really amazing, Matt, because most people thought that it took about 10 years to grow a lobster to this size, about three to five pounds, and we've done it in this tank in just three years. So we're very hopeful that someday we'll be farming lobster just like people are farming cattle. A number of years ago was the Green Revolution, being able to feed the world, the breadbasket of the world, and we can do the same thing actually with water and be the blue revolution and feed the world with water and the organisms that we grow in it. Joe, one of our guys and an expert wildlife handler, got a bird down. We had to be careful, though. Not only do we risk hurting the eagle, but their sharp beak and talons could do damage to us as well. With the bird comfortably on the ground, we set about our work. Brian explains. This is a cooperative project with the Everglades National Park. And essentially, uh, it's one of the first times I've actually let people come in here and actually physically touch the birds. And essentially, what we're trying to do is taking blood serum analysis with what is normal for these birds as at this time in their life, especially with the condition of Florida Bay as it is today. What we're trying to do is basically monitor the health of these young eaglets. And the only way we're going to do that, one of the best ways is number one, taking cultures, seeing what is normally grown in the birds bacterial-wise. Number two is running the serum chemistry on these birds to find out what is normal, what is the enzyme levels, percentages that we're encountering today. And number three, by banding these birds, we can definitely identify this bird, hopefully, for uh, future use. And, but what I mean by future use is how these birds basically survive in the wild, survival rates, do they stay in this area year after year, and essentially, as the adults die out, do these young birds, as they become older, and mature, five, six years old, when they develop the white head and the white tails, do they essentially move into these unoccupied territories? Hi, I'm Gina Molina. I'm in Must Plus, a part of the Youth Alive program here at the Museum of Science. Must Plus is a part of Macintosh using science teams. It's really neat because you get to use Macintosh computers and work in the field. Alberto Ramirez is one of our co-directors. Our students in Must are recruited from five inner city schools that are our partners, our partners in this Must program. We did a small survey here on the beach, and even after cleanup, they found all these trash that people leave here or are left after cleanup. What they do, they classify, separate it, and then we wait it. That's what they are doing now. And after this, we go back to the computer lab where the students input all this information into a spreadsheet and databases so they can document all of these findings. This is relevant because we're conducting this at different places along the coast to illustrate what really happens when people leave a lot of trash behind. He says it's educational, but I say it's fun. So we're opening an opportunity for them to see what science is like. It's also fun, not only formulas and memorizing strange names in Latin, but actually seeing the organisms seeing the processes that take place in the natural environment and then relating them to their everyday life. We try to make them aware of the opportunities that there are if they follow a science or technological career. We are concentrating, giving them some competencies and skills that will be needed for the workforce of the future. Hey, there you have it. This Must program is both cool and fun. Well, see you soon. We'll be right back after this.
This is Brian Mealy. Join me aboard the Columbus Caravel, August 22nd through September 5th, as we explore the wildlife and waters off Iceland and Greenland. Call this number today. With our banding and sampling work finished, it was time to return the eagles to their nests. Looking up, I spied the mother bird circling around overhead. We all knew we needed to work quickly and safely so that we didn't disturb too much around us. With the mother eagle above, it was certainly time to do both and then get out of there quickly. The day wore on. We were attacked by wind, cold, and rain as we found some baby ospreys and followed the same procedure with them as we did with the eagles. Besides the exhilaration and excitement I felt being so close to these wild animals, I was also feeling a need for some dry clothes and the familiar surroundings of land, recognizable land. I can't say I was sorry to see Key Largo again. It was quite an adventure and I was glad to be a part of it. I only hope that one day I'll be able to return and follow up with the birds, but this time as a scientist. Search on, man. Wisdom. Well, we're out of time. Hope you discovered something with us. But there's still a whole ocean to explore. Ciao, see you soon. This Channel 4 The More You Know special was brought to you by McDonald's.